All right, let's stand up and sing together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the rain. You freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the rain. You freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the rain. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you'll do great things. Amen. I'm so glad you're here this morning. If you're a guest here this morning, welcome to Hunter Hills. Uh, we're excited you're here. But if, if you're not a guest and you're just one of our members, thank you so much for being here uh, this morning. I'm excited uh, about today. Today is going to be a good, good day. Hey, Ellie, you ready to sing Shout Hallelujah? I, you got to tell me though. Are you ready? All right. I'll take. I will take your silence as acceptance. <laughs> shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah unto the Lord! Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah unto the Lord! Sing aloud to God. Let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all 
creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high, praise him, O ye heaven of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise. Give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and Mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth judges all, praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them pray, praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, far above the earth and sky. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, Hunter Hills. It is good to see you all here today. Thank you uh, for being a part of our worship time together. We've got a lot of stuff to share with you this morning, so you're going to have to, as they say in Bible class, put on your listening ears and hear all of these great announcements that we have of things that are happening. But before we do that, I do want to look over here and see Terry Williams is here. It's good to see him just two short weeks after... Uh, having a stroke, and it is so, so good to see him here this morning. Lucas is over here. Good to see him. He's getting better every day. So we just got so many things things to be thankful for. We do want to continue to remember the Lathams, especially uh, Bill and Annette. And I think Annette is getting better, getting a little stronger, but we do need to continue to uh, remember her uh, in our prayers. So, all right, here we go. A lot of things to talk about. So first... This Wednesday night, we will be having dinner together. That will be at 5.30. It is a Mexican menu this week. There'll be a link that'll go out tomorrow for you to sign up for that. So be sure that you do that for Wednesday night. Then on Friday night right here at the building, our 20s and 30s class, and I just got to tell you, I'm so excited about our 20s and 30s class. It's been so good, and we've enjoyed it so much. We're going to get together Friday night, fun pizza and game night. So it's going to be a great time. 
If you fall into that category or if your brain thinks you're 20 or 30, you come join us this Friday night here at the building. And then the very next night, Saturday night on the 7th, that's going to be our gifted ministry is going to do a limbo and karaoke night for our special needs community. Some of you, your minds will not allow you to do that. So, uh, but you can still come and be a part of it. Uh, we're going to need some uh, things to go with that, some chips, dessert, and drinks. If you'd like to bring those, you can bring them Wednesday night when you come to eat your Mexican dinner. All right, on Sunday, the 15th of October, we're going to do this. This is a new thing, a night of praise for our young people, our children, and our teens. And we're going to be hosting several churches from other areas coming here on October the 15th. That is going to be at 530 here at the building, and then we'll enjoy a time of fellowship uh, after that with, of course, food. So be sure to put that on your calendar as well. Uh, the Agape Pecan Ministry Sale begins today. If you would like some pecans, you can see Kelsey Manley, and she will be glad to um, help you with that. And then the announcement we've been making for a couple of weeks, we're still looking for somebody that has skill and desire uh, that would be willing to help us with our website and graphics design. A volunteer position, but the stars in your crown will be innumerable. Uh, so if you have a heart for that, uh, let the church office know that. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff, so be sure you remember all of that. But we got a double blessing this morning before we get started. We get to welcome a new family, and we get to bless a baby. So I want to invite the Bells up here, Courtney and Taylor and Perry and baby Dawson and any of your family that would like to come, they are more than welcome as well. I see them spreading now. Not Taylor and Courtney, but the rest of their family. This is Courtney and Taylor Bell. This is Perry. And this is baby Dawson. And we want to welcome them officially to Hunter Hills. They've been here for a while. Uh, we love the Bell family and appreciate them so, so much. And we are excited to have them be a part of the Hunter Hills family. Taylor drives around in a white truck. Um, I'm not sure what he does while he does that, but he drives around in a white truck. I know it's something to do with towers and something or another. There you go. If you want to know more details about that, you see Taylor. He'll be glad to tell you. And I think Courtney's working at a law office still. No, you're not working at a law office. Where are you working now? Marketing company. Oh, a marketing company. Okay. That's interesting. Let's welcome the Bells to Hunter Hills. And then, of course, we have Baby Dawson who is the newest member of the Bell family, a beautiful baby whose eyes are open at this very moment. So that is, well, they were open at this very moment. They just, they just closed. But we want to do a baby blessing as we welcome Perry. Perry, you want to hold the Bible? I'm going to let you hold this too. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we do this baby blessing this morning. I will read and then you will, you will respond. Lord, baby Dawson's tiny hands are so trusting. They are so innocent. Guide his way. Make his path straight and give him strength. When he is lonely, may we reach out to him and remind him that you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. You are the God who is present. When he is attacked by illness or disease, may he look to you. You are the God who heals when he experiences defeat, may he look to you. You are our victory. When he is needy or poor, may he reach out to us and to you. You are the Lord, our provider. When he is lost or feels without a purpose, please guide him. You are the Lord, our shepherd. Our prayer is that baby Dawson will not want. Lord, that you will make him lie down in green pastures, that you will lead him by the still waters, that you will restore his soul. May you lead him in the paths of righteousness for your sake. Even though he may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will fear no evil, for you are with him. May your rod and your staff comfort him. May you prepare a table before him in the presence of his enemies. May you anoint his head with oil. May his cup overflow. May goodness and mercy follow him all the days of his life. 
And we pray most of all that he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And together we all say, amen. All right, let's welcome baby Dawson. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, see how great, how great. morning church can you believe it's October already so they asked me because it's the first Sunday in October to say something about giving so I've got a scripture here I'd like to read uh, for you and then I'd like to give you a personal thought Uh, 2nd Corinthians 9 6 through 8 says each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And this is another way to look at it. Cheerfully giving is a person who gives of what they have joyfully, not in a reluctant manner. We're to give from our hearts, not from what we budget from our monthly income. If we look back at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we see that Christ, who was rich, made himself poor so that we may become rich. Um, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago when, when we were younger um, and didn't have a whole lot and we're going to church, you know, we were, we were going over this idea of giving and, uh, you know, of course our budget was extremely tight and uh, so we set, we laid some aside, you know, and we said, okay, this is what we're going to give. But, you know, the, the thought of being a cheerful giver I think comes through time you know it's not like we were just like happy to give away like what we thought might be our last twenty dollars or whatever you know so it was it was something giving as a is a learning process on how to how to give it freely and cheerfully but over time and giving to missions and thing seeing good things happen with your money it really is uh, you can be cheerful in giving it and as you get older, you'll see that giving it away is just makes you, you know, happier and happier. So just uh, something to think about this morning. Um, there's several ways that you can give uh, to our ministries here and to this church. Uh, we've got brown boxes back there at the back. And uh, I think there's about 10 different ways that you can give electronically so that you can see Sandy or the front office. And, and they'll be happy to set you up with that. 
Uh, all right, so let's go into our uh, the communion thought. I've got a little paragraph I want to read because I don't want to miss anything that I was thinking. Uh, I was thinking about all my church family and friends we and I have been praying for. And we get that prayer list via email or whatever. We got all those guys that we're praying for. And I started thinking about Jesus made it possible for us to get relief through prayer and just knowing that he has already prepared a place for us where all our earthly troubles will be over. Communion is a great time to focus on Jesus in praise and thankfulness for his sacrifice. It's also a great time to lay our cares and burdens at his feet. Matthew 11, 29 and 30 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Back in July, we'll put a slide up here, and it said, Words make you think a thought. Music makes you feel a feeling. A song makes you feel a thought. And I don't know about you, but I'm wired that way. When, when these guys sing some of these songs and I start processing these words, it really starts to hit me emotionally and I start applying it to myself. Um, and it really makes me reflect on what Jesus has done for me and, and you too. So uh, the song that they're going to sing this morning is Living Hope. And I've got the lyrics here and I want to read those lyrics to you because there's just so much in them. The song goes, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. You know, it's rare that when things are going great in our life and everything is going our way, that we look for God like we do when we're in desperation. But when, when, we're, when we're in desperation, we're looking for him. I'm looking for him. Um, then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Yeah, that's the problem with having two pages. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. There's not a person in this room this morning that doesn't have a trial or tribulation of some kind. And some of them are very, very heavy, very heavy. But in this life, it's temporary. And it's hard to imagine that these things that we go through here are just, they're a vapor right? But he says, I'm yours forever, forever. When this is said and done, I'm yours. You belong to me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. I don't know about you, but I don't like graves. I don't like funerals. And I don't like, I don't like that stuff. So to hear declared the grave has no claim on me means a whole lot to me. It says, Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You've broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh God. You are my living hope. In Revelation 21.4, it says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away so this communion thought this jesus christ that died for us this morning we're celebrating him we're celebrating his body we're celebrating his blood most of all we're celebrating his resurrection because he came out of that grave which means we can too and that's that's awesome uh, this morning, as we get ready to pass the communion, there's two cups. Uh, the bread is in the bottom cup. The fruit of the vine is in the top cup. Um, just be gentle hands when you pull them apart, and you should be okay. Let's pray. Lord God, we're just so thankful that we can be here this morning, that Jesus has conquered death for us, that you loved us enough that you sent your son for us to die in our place. 
And we look forward to that day, Lord God, and, we, and uh, we're so thankful for the hope that gets us through this life and gets us through our troubles here on earth because we all know that one day we'll be in heaven with you and that things are going to be wonderful. Uh, and we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Let's all stand together and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. kindergarten-aged kiddos. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you guys to your time of learning, your time of worship, a uh, special time that we have dedicated just for you guys. So ride out those back doors and 
to the left and somebody will be there to greet you. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited because after singing that song, we get to go into scripture and read about this hope that we have in Christ. It's a great text to talk about this hope, this living hope that we have through Jesus. We're in 1 John chapter 2, and this morning we're going to look at the last two verses of 1 John 2. We're going to be in verses 28 and 29. Real quickly, though, last week Will preached on verses 18 through 27. That's, that's how it works. He preached 18 through 27, and what the passage was about last week is that John warns his readers that there is an antichrist coming. In fact, there are many antichrists among the people. These antichrists are those who have come into the church to try to teach that Jesus is not the Son of God. He's not the Christ who has come into the flesh. John calls these people the antichrist. And so he warns them. And then last week, the section that Will preached on concludes with this last sentence. It says, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. The last thing that John uh, tells the people that Will told us about last week is he says the antichrists are coming. What you need to do is remain in him because you have the spirit of God who teaches you the true things. This anointing, this, this anointing that Will talked about last week, as he, uh, as he explained, it is the Holy Spirit and this Holy Spirit teaches us about Christ. And we need to remain in this teaching and we need to remain in Christ. So now we come to verse 28. And this is what John tells his readers. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. So John repeats this side by side. He says, remain in him, and then he says, continue in him, although the reason is a little bit different this time. It's actually flipped. You need to remain in him because there are antichrists that are coming, but also you need to remain in him because Christ is coming. So first of all, we need to look at and understand what it means to remain in Christ or to continue in Christ. We get an explanation. This language is very reminiscent of John chapter 15, where Jesus tells us to remain in him. So in John chapter 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing. So Jesus says, I am in you, and what you need to do is remain in me. But still, what hasn't quite been answered yet is what does it mean to remain in Christ? And Jesus tells us this starting in John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay one's life down for, one, for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus makes it clear what it means to remain in him. To remain in him is to keep his commands. And in John chapter 15, Jesus connects this teaching to one specific command. Love one another as I have loved you. It's this new command that's given. In a sense, it's old because the command has always been to love, but now this love is referenced in a new way. It's referenced in Christ giving up his life. But it only makes sense that when Jesus connects the idea of obeying his commands to remaining in him, that the command that he wants to get out there more than anything is love. Because we see in the Gospels, Jesus teaches that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To remain in God and to remain in Christ is to practice this life of love because the God who we serve, as we'll see later in this book of 1 John, this God who we serve is love. So to remain in God and to remain in Christ is to practice this life 
of love. And so Jesus shows us, he doesn't just teach us what love is, but he actually shows us what it is. And through the life of Jesus, we see how love is manifested in so many different ways in the life of Jesus. Of course, we normally think of Jesus' love as the tender and gentle love that is compassionate and ready to serve those who are in need. And we see Jesus doing that all over the Gospels. But love is also shown by Jesus in other ways. Sometimes love is very strong. It uses strong language and strong words. It can be confrontational. Jesus is strong and confrontational towards the religious leaders whenever what they do is harming God's people and God's children. Jesus tells the religious people, if you cause one of these little children of mine to stumble, it would have been better for you if a millstone had been cast, tied around your neck and you'd been cast into the sea. Jesus is strong and he's bold in the face of people harming his people because love protects it's strong. Jesus' love is also seen in his strong confrontation and rebuke of religious leaders in different ways. He uses this language not just to protect other people, but also to rebuke the religious leaders because he loves them. He gives strong rebukes to them because he cares for them. Jesus' words about the religious leaders, he calls them whitewashed tombs who they look clean on the outside, but inside they are full of death. But yet what Jesus also says to the religious leaders, he calls out to them and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you in like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Jesus uses harsh, strong, angry language towards the Pharisees sometimes, but it's out of his love and his desire to gather them in. And so Jesus gives us this complete picture of what love is, but all of these pictures are mostly magnified by the fact that Jesus shows us his love by laying his life down for his friends. The picture that Jesus shows us of love is one in which people do good for the other person. They act for the best and the good of other people, even if it comes at their own expense. That's really what love is all about, is doing good for others, even if it's at your own expense. And so for Jesus to remain in him and to remain in his love is to follow his commandments and to live this life of love where we give ourselves for the sake of other people and for their good. And so John says you need to remain in Christ. You need to live this life of love so that when Christ appears, you will be confident for him, before him and not unashamed. So first of all, we've got this idea that Jesus is coming back. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details. I'm not the one who's qualified to be able to tell you all of the different things about Christ's return. There's a lot of different language that's in the New Testament about Christ's return. There's a lot of different ideas and theories as to what Christ's return looks like. But how do we understand 2,000 years later after Christ? ascended and is at the right hand of God, how should we understand Christ returning? Because it kind of seems like it's been a long time. I can't give all the answers, but it seems in the New Testament there's a couple of ways we should approach Christ's coming. Number one, we can never be too certain when Christ is going to come. Jesus says he is going to come like a thief in the night. And so any attempt to try to take some numbers in the Bible and figure out exactly when Jesus is going to come... It may not work out. In fact, anybody who has attempted to say when Jesus is going to come back, if they predicted it's before today, October 1st, 2023, that prediction failed. And so we can never be too certain when Christ is going to come back. But on the other hand, because we've swung, uh, we've swung to the other side because it's been 2,000 years, we're now, we're kind of more than likely to think, well, he's probably not going to come in our lifetime. That may very well be true, but it seems in the New Testament, the idea that Jesus' disciples should always have is that Christ's return is imminent, that it could always be at hand, that it could happen at any moment. We should never be certain, but I'm also, I also think that certainty can run the other way. We shouldn't be certain that he's not going to come back either. And so we live this life of believing that Christ's coming back is imminent. It could happen at any time. And so John warns his people 
You need to remain in Christ so that when he appears, you may be confident before him rather than ashamed. And so the basis of whether we're confident before Christ is if we've remained in him. It's whether we obey Christ's commands and live this life of love that he teaches us. Now that sounds a little scary, right? That my, my ability to be confident before Christ whenever I see him again is based on whether I'm living this life of love. But what John is teaching here really runs right along what Jesus teaches us about him coming back. It's parallel to what Jesus says in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. In Matthew 24 and 25, we get the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus teaches us about his coming back. He teaches about some other things, like the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. But Jesus also makes his disciples aware that one day I'm going to come back. And what Jesus teaches them is that you need to be prepared. And so in Matthew 25, Jesus gives three teachings, two parables and one separate teaching on how Jesus' followers should be when he comes back. Just like John says, Jesus says, you need to be prepared so that you can be confident when I come back. He has three teachings. The first teaching is the parable of the ten virgins. Ten women who are getting ready for a wedding. The bridegroom, Christ, is about to arrive. And these young ladies need to be prepared. But in this parable, the main way to understand their preparation is whether they have oils for their lamps so that they can light their lamps and follow the bridegroom just in case he comes at night. If they don't have their lamps, they can't follow him at night. And so five of them are prepared, five of them are not. The main point of this teaching is Jesus says, you as my followers, you need to be prepared. Don't be like the five women who don't have your oil for your lamps because you're going to be too late. So he says, my followers need to be prepared. But that's all he says. He doesn't explain what the preparation is. He just says you need to be prepared. He gives us a little more detail in the next parable, which is the parable of the talents. It's the parable of a master who's about to go on a long journey. And so he gives three servants a different amount of money. He gives one servant five bags of gold, another servant three bags of gold, and then another servant one bag of gold. And he goes off on this long journey. Well, then this master comes back, and when this master comes back, he's going to judge his servants according to if they've been faithful with what the master has given them. See, two servants did what they were supposed to. They took the money that they were given, they invested it, and they doubled the investment. But there was one servant... When the master arrives, who decided to dig a hole, bury his treasure, he did nothing with what his master had given him. And the master says, depart from me, you evil and wicked servant. Jesus' teaching is that you need to be prepared. And part of the way that you're prepared when I arrive back is if you are faithful with what I have given you. But then we get to a third teaching, which isn't really a parable. It's the last teaching in Matthew chapter 25. And it's the last portion of the Olivet Discourse where Jesus talks about his arrival again. And he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to call the nations to myself and I'm going to divide them between the sheep and the goats. And I'm going to judge the sheep and the goats. And many of you already know what this division is based on. What is this division based on between the sheep and the goats? The division is how the people have treated the least of these. Jesus says the goats are the people who are going to receive punishment because they never visited people in prison. When they saw people who were hungry, they didn't give them food. When they saw people who were thirsty, they didn't give them anything to drink. They saw the people who were, in, who were the least of these and they didn't do anything about it. And he says to them, what you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. But he says to the sheep that they can come and inherit eternal life because when they saw the least of these, they gave them food, they gave them water, they gave them clothing, they visited them in the prisons. Jesus says the confidence that people can have when they face Jesus, have they lived this life of love? Jesus, in Matthew 25, in the starkest, clearest terms, says exactly what John says here. Your confidence before Christ is based on whether you have remained in him and kept his commands. To 
to some of us, that might seem a little scary because it kind of seems like it's on me. But luckily, John goes further and explains something else in verse 29. So back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So once again, John makes the connection that remaining in Christ is about following his teachings because he says, we know that God is righteous and anyone who does what is right has been born of him. So when you appear before Christ or when Christ appears before you, have you done what is right? But here's, here's the big thing. This is really important for this morning because what John says is the one who does what is right has been born of him. This is important because it should help us understand that following and keeping the commands of Christ is not based on our own power or our own ability, but rather it's based on God's power in our lives. Because what John says is that the one who does what is right, they are born of God. This language of being born of God is John's language for what he talks about when he talks about the Spirit being in our lives, God giving us his own Spirit. For John, what it means to become a Christian is it means to believe in Christ, and when you receive Christ, God gives you his Spirit, and thus he gives you new life, which John calls this new birth. And this new birth is a totally different form of life where you live this life of love. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, John says that those who received Christ, Christ gave them the right to become children of God, born not of the will of man, born not of the will of flesh, but born of God. And so he explains that Christ gives this right to people to become born of God. And later in chapter 3, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. And he says, if you want to see the kingdom, you need to be born again. Nicodemus is a little confused. And Jesus explains, flesh is born of flesh, but spirit is born of spirit. You've been born of flesh, but now you need to be born of the spirit John teaches the spiritual reality when we receive Christ, we are made children of God. And as children of God, what we now at least have the ability to do is to live like our Father. For John, it seems almost natural. A person acts like their father. A person acts like their parent. John, once again, he's using words that he borrows from Jesus' language in the book of John. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having another confrontation with religious leaders. And these religious leaders say, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus says, that's not true. You're not children of Abraham, because if you were children of Abraham, you would act like Abraham. You would believe like Abraham. But instead, you're a liar. And if you're a liar, that means you are a child of Satan, because Satan is the father of lies. For John... A child acts like their father. And so what John is saying here is that our confidence before Christ is based on whether we continue in Christ. But here's the important part, that we continue in Christ and we obey his commands because God's power is within us. We confess Christ as Lord and God gives us this new birth by which he gives us this new spirit. This God who is love comes into our lives. We are made the temple of God where he dwells in us and God bears love in our hearts. He produces love in our lives and in our hearts so that we can go out and live like Christ. For John, this almost seems natural, but it's not totally natural. There's a sense to which even as God lives in us, we still need to cooperate and receive the grace of God so that we can go out and do the right thing. John seems to be aware of the idea that we can cut Christ out of our lives. But the way that we cut Christ out of our lives is by walking away from his commands. But the relationship for the Christian and God is that God has come to live within the Christian. So God is in the Christian. And the Christian is, remains in God by walking according to the commands that God empowers and enables him to live according to. And so this is our living hope. 
the living hope that we have is that if we were left to our own, we would still be under the power of sin. But God gave Jesus Christ so that he would die and resurrect so that we could be called children of God, so that we could receive the Spirit of God, and we can be confident when Christ comes back. What a powerful, profound, amazing thing that we can come before God and we can be confident before Him because He has made us children of God. Children who walk according to love. This world may try to disciple us to walk in hate, to hate our enemies, to hate those who don't love us, to hate the person next to us, but it's God's Spirit who lives within us who's bearing love within our lives and within our hearts and makes us able to to walk this life. I'm going to invite the worship team to go ahead. You can go ahead and come up. And we're about to sing this song, Cornerstone. And this song teaches a truth that Christ is the cornerstone of the church. He's the, corner, he's the cornerstone of this new temple that God has made. This new temple is made up of all believers where we all together are this one temple that God has made that he lives within and Christ is this cornerstone, the foundation of everything that we do because now that we've been made the temple of God, God who is love lives within us so that we can go out into the world, we can love the least of these, we can love our neighbors as ourselves and we can love God all because it is God who empowers us, who makes us able to do these things. As we sing Cornerstone, I also want to invite the elders and any ministers to stand in the back. If you need anything, if you feel that you need God's grace in your life for any reason right now, if, you, if there's anything you need prayers over, we would love to have one of our elders or ministers cover you in prayer as we sing Cornerstone together. Let's praise God and thank him for the gift that he's done for us as we sing Cornerstone together. So let's stand up together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the same. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy day,
Today's been a good day. We're glad that you are all here. Thank you to our praise team, to, to David and to Stephen this morning especially. It's interesting that our, our benediction does remind us who we are, our identity in Christ, that we are God's chosen people, and that we can be ready when the Lord comes again. So let's share this benediction together as we close. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that belongs to God, that we may declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. You are sent.